Okay, um, I guess we'll start the, the webinar. So as uh, the pandemic moves along uh, its path, real estate teams and professionals are continually looking for guidance for uh, their respective course of action being operational, investment, development, financing, or other roles. Um, so hello everyone. On behalf of the counselors of real estate, it is a distinct privilege to welcome you to this session, What's Next for Real Estate and Life Experience webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Michel Couillard, the 2020 Global Chair of the Counselors of Real Estate. The Counselors is an international group of highly skilled and trusted advisors solving the world's most complex real estate challenges, experience, innovative, credential, uh, problem solvers. Counselors practice in more than 20 countries and offer expertise in more than 50 real estate disciplines across all asset types and classes. Each has earned the prestigious CRE designation. This webinar series represents the very essence of the compelling thought leadership for which the Counselors of Real Estate is known. To learn more about the organization and its thousand real estate professional, please visit CRE.org. While attendees will be muted during the course of today's events, you're encouraged to utilize the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen should you wish to submit a question. Your participation is welcome and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. So today, we're grateful to hear from a friend of the counselors, um, Spencer Levy, Chairman of America's Research and Senior Economic Advisor at CBRE. Spencer is one of the most entertaining and enlightening observer of the American and global urban scene. He has developed a cult following with his discussion on the convergence of economic and real estate realities and the global cities, global city of the future. As you'll see, he combines his experience as a lawyer and an investment banker to create presentations that are deep, compelling, and engaging. Spencer has guest lectured in major universities, including his alma mater, Harvard and Cornell, in addition to Columbia, NYU, John Hopkins, and Georgetown. He is a recipient of multiple industry awards, including the Cornet Luminary Award for Excellence in Public Speaking, the CBRE Tremel Crow Master Builder Award, and the CBRE Gary G. Bibbon Teamwork Award. Spencer sits on the boards of the Baltimore Leadership of School of Young Women and Herbert Alumni Real Estate. Complimenting Spencer today is the witty yet Penetrating, moderating style of Mario Lefebvre, CRE Regional Director and Senior Economist at the Bank of Canada, Canada's Central Bank. Mario previously served as Vice President of Research, Global Real Estate Markets at Ivano Cambridge. His CV also includes position uh, of President and CEO of UDI, the Urban Development Institute, a Canadian lobby group for commercial real estate industry. Director of the Center of Municipal Studies for the Conference Board of Canada, the country's largest economic think tank, and the previous and a previous role at the Bank of Canada as sectorial economist. Mario holds a, ma a master's degree in economics at the University of Montreal, and is co-author of Power Play: The Business Economics of Pro Sports. Gentlemen, welcome. I thought what a trip this will be. So, Spencer, I now turn this program to you. Terrific. Well, Matt, what I'm, we're going to do today is I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, Mario and I are then going to debate everything I said for those uh, 20 minutes, and then we're going to take whatever questions you have. And, um, you know, in the many roles that I play here today, uh, I'm playing the role of the semi-invisible man as I move back and forth. And I hope you'll appreciate why I'm playing this role today, because uh, I am uh, turning 50 tomorrow, and my wife uh, gave me a surprise gift uh, which was a uh, visit to the eastern shore of Maryland, St. Michael's. Uh, and so I am calling in from there today, um, and I hope that you all have opportunities like this as well. So what are we talking about here uh, in St. Michael's, uh, in eastern uh, Maryland, where I am today, uh, which is a beautiful place um, that uh, has great history? Uh, it brings me to the title of today's presentation, which is Veblen, which was a great economist from many moons ago who talked about goods in a way that said some goods get more desirable the more expensive they are. And why is that? Why do certain purses or handbags get more desirable the more expensive they are? 
And the reason for that is they are a status symbol. They are, they bring things more than their functional use. And I want you to think about that name Veblen now in the context of commercial real estate, because that is what's going to be happening with office and retail and hotel demand. Because when you think about real estate use, if you think about it purely as a functional matter, you'll reach a conclusion. And that conclusion is that most real estate with the exception of multifamily and industrial is a want, not a need. And when you say that, you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't need office, retail, hotels anymore? Well, that's what uh, some of the doubters are saying in the marketplace today. Well, given that this is a real estate presentation, you can guess I am not one of those doubters. Because I have been saying for years in my own presentations that most real estate is a want, not a need. And some of that has come to the fore today. But people are still going to want it. And why are they going to want it? Because according to the Harvard Business Review, Great companies focus on productivity, not efficiency. Going right back to Mr. Veblen, what does that mean? It means that people will go back to the office because it makes them better. They will go back to retail because it makes them happier. They will go back to hotels because it brings them all of the above. So Veblen is the theme of today's presentation. Now, as we talk about today in commercial real estate, I also want to give you a subtitle, which is new cards. I've been lecturing like this now almost nonstop, almost every day for the last six months. And I'm trying not to give you things you already know. I'm going to talk about things that are new, that are happening right now, that will be impacting the commercial real estate industry for the next two to three years. But stuff that's on the facts on the ground right now. Let's start macro. Macro, the economy is doing well. And when I say well, I don't mean great well. I mean about as expected as we've been talking back since March. And where do you see the economy doing reasonably well in terms of it outperforming for GDP in the second quarter, in terms of it outperforming for the jobs report for June, July, and August, in terms of the stock market? And by the way, don't discount the stock market. According to Ben Bernanke in his book, Courage to Lead, the stock market is the single most important indicator of both business and consumer confidence. So the fact that it has been doing well, albeit a little choppy over the last couple of days, is an important indicator that things will be getting better sooner. But unfortunately, what happened in the last couple of months is a, what I would call a plateauing. So you all wanna talk about these and square root shapes, all kinds of different shapes of the economy. Well, we plateaued in many important economic and microeconomic indicators starting in the beginning of June. And why did that happen? Because the disease unleashed its ugly head again in America, leading to more shutdowns. It had been much more difficult to deal with than we could, which leads us to a conclusion which I didn't want to reach, which frankly, my opinion changed uh, starting in June, July, and August, which that in order to fully recover, we're gonna need a vaccine. That's the bad news. The good news is the vaccine is gonna come way faster than any of us had reasonably anticipated through what President Trump and his team called Project Warp Speed, what really means that a first viable vaccine has an actually reasonable likelihood of happening before the end of 2020. So that's the bad news is that we're vaccine dependent for the overall takeoff. But the good news is it's gonna come much faster than we think. And we still think that 2021 is going to be a very good year in the United States from a macro perspective and we will begin to see material healing in the commercial real estate sector. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Before we go there, I wanna talk about the other elephant sitting in the corner of the room, which is the election. And I get a lot of questions about the election, about what we should do as commercial real estate professionals, given that we have a very important election coming up in November. My answer is very simple. Think local, not federal. Now, there are some federal issues from an economic standpoint that will be different under a Trump versus a Biden administration. And by the way, I just wanna be very clear. There are some very sensitive social issues that I'm not going to address here. And those are completely up to the individual voter. I'm gonna analyze it purely from an economic point of view. Uh, from an economic point of view, macroeconomically, 
there's cases to be made for either one of them. From a Biden administration, likely to be more stimulative in the short term. The Democratic proposal, the HEROES Act of $3 trillion, has a much better likelihood of happening under Biden than it would under Trump. At the same time, two, three years down the road, we are likely to face higher taxes under a Democrat than we are under Republican. So they give us and they take it away. So from a macroeconomic perspective, you can make the case for either one of them. But from a microeconomic perspective, this is where I think it really matters that you know local politics. So we, have, we follow places around the country that have either fiscal problems due to pension plans, uh, and we follow places that have challenges due to uh, lack of affordable housing, which increases rent control. Those are the types of issues that you should be underwriting going forward when you're making a determination of how the politics of 2020 are going to impact your commercial real estate, local, not federal. Now, there are shades of gray from a federal standpoint. The shades of gray have to do with politically sensitive industries. Politically sensitive industries include oil and gas, healthcare, the military, where under one administration or another, you will see more or less spending in those areas, which will impact local economies that have a high percentage of their economy in those areas. But my bottom line suggestion is that federal matters less than local. But I'm gonna make one other suggestion to you. And this is one of my first back up the truck arguments. I've written to pieces about this before that I believe that headline risk is the single best friend of the savvy real estate investor. And what does that mean? It means that I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from investors around the world that get nervous about elections or other things that quite candidly, when we look at the data going back 50 years, don't have great impact on the economy, but nevertheless causes them to make a transactional decision to buy or sell or to do neither of the above because of the election. That's good for you because it will cause some investors to hit the pause button and you should then step in and buy or transact during that time rather than them because we believe the risks of headline risk are overblown. So let's turn now to real estate. And let's talk first about the capital markets. Much like the overall economy, the, the capital markets for commercial real estate plateaued starting around June. When I say plateaued, it means deal volume kind of flatlined, didn't go down, but really started to steadily stay at around that same level from a new deals coming to market standpoint. Now, where we did see a steady increase is the amount of CAs, confidentiality agreements that we're signing. They are continuing to increase, but the number of deals brought to market stalled, except for really in industrial and multifamily, while they uh, continue to come to market at a much higher level than others, those are the only two areas where we're seeing great strength of new deals coming to market. It is in retail, office and hotels where the market has been uh, almost not shut down completely but very very slow and we don't expect it to materially improve in those areas in the short term and in the short term meaning until we see less travel restrictions remember what i said a moment ago we're seeing a huge increase in the number of confidentiality agreements signed and some of them are from foreign investors but some of the big foreign investor groups can't buy today because they can't kick the bricks some of them are required to kick the bricks physically in order to do that. Now I know that South Korea, as an example, just changed their laws for some of their pension funds so they don't have to have as much physical inspection so they can come in. But many German investors I know still have that requirement and it is going to keep their number down. That's the bad news. Here's the really, really good news. If there's a silver lining to the apocalypse that we've been going through for the last several months, it is that the 10 year treasury as of when I last checked was 71 bips. And what does that mean? It means that the hedging costs to buy in the United States from Europe and in Asia have come down substantially. It used to be 350 basis points per dollar per year. So if you went back to November of 2018, now it's under 200 basis points from Europe and Asian investors some have even lower costs than that. And because of that, we believe that once travel restrictions are lifted, foreign investment, which has ticked down in the United States over the last couple of years will be one of the engines that will push us forward going forward because it's cheaper to invest in the United States. Now, I'll give you one little new cards, silver lining. I do watch transaction volume on a daily basis. If you take a look at my screen of my computer, it looks like a pinball machine with how much information I get. But if you take a look at it, you'll see that we did see a modest post Labor Day bump in terms of new transactions, new sales. And now it's not as big as we've seen in the past, 
But to me, that was a very positive side that people are getting back to business. Another very positive sign that people are getting back to business, again, not perfectly, much slower rate, is that my office, where I office in Baltimore, is opening up next week, and I will proudly but safely go there with my team. Now let me talk to you about the other elephants sitting in the corner of the room when we're talking from a micro perspective. The macro perspective is the presidential election. The micro perspective is values. What is happening to commercial real estate values? I was on a phone call yesterday with one of the largest investors in the world, and we spent an hour debating what's happening to office values. I'll tell you what we told them. We don't know. And we have more information than anybody else. And when I say we don't know, it doesn't mean we don't know. We know a lot. But what we do know is this. There haven't been enough trades yet to say that office values have fallen by 5, 10, 20 percent for some of the other asset classes, for some of the more distressed asset types. But overall, we don't know exactly how much value diminution has occurred. But we will say this. For the best assets with long-term stable leases with credit tenants, there's been almost no change in value. And we know that based upon actual transactions that we have seen. So for the best stuff, no change in value. And I'll go one step further. Cap rates, which is the question we get every day. And by the way, CBRE is posting its cap rate survey for the first half or for the last couple of months, uh, starting two weeks. So we'll know what the people think cap rates are. Well, I'll tell you what we think cap rates are before we see the survey is that for the same best assets in office, in multifamily, in industrial, cap rates aren't gonna move. As a matter of fact, based upon actual evidence, we have seen some assets in industrial multifamily for the very best assets where cap rates have gone down in the short term. Now, I'm giving you a misleadingly rosy picture at the moment. We're not saying that values aren't going to go down. Overall, they are. And the value fall is probably gonna be 5% to 20%. And I know of some of the most distressed assets, hotels that are in transition at over 30%. And that's going to happen over the intermediate term over the next year or so, until people get back to use of these places so that they can pay rent. Now on the rent side, I just got my, my uh, report from my colleague, Grayson Gill, who's our COO for property management in the Americas just prior to today's call. And our August rent collections were excellent. They were excellent in office, industrial, multifamily. We don't manage a lot of multi. And retail, they've stabilized at a higher level, you know, around 60%. So the bottom line is this, is that we are slow and steady right now, but we are not winning the race yet. We are, however, at a point where we believe that as the market continues to heal, you are going to begin to see more trades and we'll have more transparency into values. So at that point, we'll know, is it a 5%? 10%, 20% fall in value and how long it's going to take. But the good news is that most of the value diminution is going to be due to NOI diminution, not cap rate expansion. The market is deep and liquid with equity capital where the market is constrained today is in debt capital. There's plenty of debt capital in multifamily. There's plenty of debt capital for industrial, for stabilized industrial. There isn't actually a lot of debt capital for spec industrial but once you get beyond those two asset classes the debt markets still remain very challenged for retail and hotels of course but increasingly for office and that's going to be the challenge that they're going to face and that is why office retail and hotels likely to face much more cap rate expansion than we'll see in industrial multifamily which as i suggested you might see none now we've talked about the different asset types let me dig a little bit deeper into those asset types for just a moment our general way of looking at the market over the last four or five months has not changed, but some of the facts on the ground have changed. And the basic way we have looked at the market is breaking the different asset classes into what we call our one, two, three scenarios. And one, two, three means one asset class is coming back in year one, no surprise, multifamily and industrial. Asset class in year two, which is office, and we can talk about that because I know that's where most of your questions are gonna come from. And then in year three, and that's going to be retail and hotels. Let's start at the scary end of the spectrum first and work back, shall we, with retail and hotels. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting between St. Michael's and Easton, Maryland. And I was in Easton, Maryland 10 years ago. And I would tell you, you know what Easton, Maryland looked like 10 years ago? It was dilapidated, it was broken down. It was a, a town that needed a lot of love. I'm here today. Now, it is beautiful. It is a resurrection that happened here. 
It's a resurrection that happened in Frederick, Maryland. And it's a resurrection that happened in Times Square, New York, 25 years ago. What does it mean? It means that retail and hotels are resilient. It means that people want to go there. This is the want versus the need thing. I want to go there. I'm here right now. And I will tell you this. This is where I jump the shark, Mario. I'm sure you're going to ask me a question about this when we debate this in a minute. You know what's going to come back to? Cruise ships. And cruise ships are going to come back. You know why? Because the only thing better than a cruise is a cheap cruise. And does anybody here want to guess what the price is right now to take a three-day cruise to the Bahamas on Carnival Cruise Lines? Anyone? Anyone? $129 for three days. They can price the goods down to zero and people will get on that ship. There was a famous movie in the 1980s called Wall Street where the expression was, greed is good. Greed works. Well, you know what works? Low prices. And people will come back to retail and hotels, albeit at a much slower pace than the other asset classes. Let's, we'll come to office last because that will be the greatest amount of our comments. But in terms of multifamily and industrial, as I suggested, from a capital markets perspective, both have performed extremely well. From a fundamental perspective, performed extremely well. So an announcement today about another 20,000 jobs or so that Amazon is hiring for. So you all know why industrial is doing well. Now there have been some shades of gray there that haven't done as well in the multifamily and industrial area. And I know I have my terrific colleague, Jeanette Rice on this very call, who is a counselor of real estate, who's probably gonna nod along right now with me. Multifamily is doing well. It's not doing well right now in the major markets. It's not doing well in New York, in San Francisco, in Chicago. As many people have said, you know what? I'm going to ride out the storm in my parents' house rather than doing it right here. So that's the challenge we have there. Now, to continue, I would suggest to you that multifamily also has these shades of gray problems in student housing and senior. But are going right back to what I said before. These create opportunities, much like the headline risk from the election, the short-term risk in senior and student will pass, pro probably not until September of next year when we have more students coming back to university. Now, office. Let's go to the asset class that I know is going to take, could take the entire part of today's presentation, but I'll only co comment on it briefly. The biggest challenge in office right now on a capital market side is price discovery. People don't know what values are because they don't know what their rent roll will look like six months to a year from now. Until we get some of that price discovery, until we see people willing and ready to trade, we won't be able to get there. But I will tell you that it's gonna take probably until the beginning of 2022 before we see the true shakeout in the office sector. That's the bad news. The good news is we're bullish on the office sector over the long term. Why? I'll tell you why. There was a great study that came out by Stanford University back in 2015, which, which talked about work from home. And work from home does work from an efficiency standpoint. It does not work from a productivity standpoint. And so what that means is that people will not be able to get what they need from a professional standpoint, learning how to communicate, learning how to, or getting promoted. You will not have the culture in the company you want. And going right back to that Harvard Business Review, quote, great companies will focus on productivity not efficiency, and people will go back to the office. Will there be a diminution in demand? Yeah, but it's called the fluid workplace. And we knew the fluid workplace was coming. We, we know it's going to continue to come. And the fluid workplace means working from your office, from your home, or from a car sitting outside of a restaurant in St. Michael's, Maryland, like I'm doing right now. But will there be countervailing forces? We know there's gonna be less density. We knew there's gonna be an upgrade cycle as people are gonna be worried not just about having better hand sanitizers, they're gonna be worried about having better HVAC. We have a terrific client of ours in Southern California called McCarthy Cook, building a $500 million office building in West Hollywood. They're putting in hydronic HVAC. What's hydronic for you non-HVAC experts out there? Myself being one of those non-HVAC experts. That's pumping hot and cold water through pipes in the walls rather than forced air, which is in most of your homes and most of your office buildings. That's the future of clean air. Clean air matters. But I'll give you one little side note that needs to be solved. You're gonna have a little bit of a wrestle between sustainability 
and wellness. Why is that? You ever wonder why you walk in through a revolving door in most office buildings in Manhattan and elsewhere? To keep the air in. It's not just there to sure your kids have fun when they visit you in the office. But you know what? If you want to get lead or energy star rated at the highest ratings, you know what gives you a demerit? Operable windows. So we still need to work out the details of sustainability versus wellness in this brave new world of office that we're going to be going to. So let me wrap up my comments like this, and I'm looking forward to my debate with my very good friend, Mario. I'm going to go back to Mr. Veblen. Want versus need. Don't get caught up on the need argument. Get caught up on the want argument because great businesses want to be in offices. People want to be in cities because of live, work, play. People want to go to restaurants and hotels because it's cool, it's fun, and they can price these things down to zero to get you back. There was a study by the ICSC two years ago, and they asked Gen Zers who are the number one users of malls, why do you go to malls? Why do you buy goods? And you could think about all these very important social reasons on why people might want to buy goods from store A versus store B. You know what was by far the number one reason why Gen Zers buy stuff at store A versus store B? Price. Value works. And that is why retail and hotels will come back. Industrial multifamily doing great will continue to be strong through this. As a matter of fact, industrial is so good that CBRE's forecast today is better for industrial than it was pre-COVID. And yes, and I will end on office. Office will come back too. Office is something that people want to have better businesses, to be able to get promoted, to learn their communication skills. And with that, Mario, I'm delighted to take any questions you have as we debate all of these topics. And thank you to the counselors for having me. Can't hear you, Mario, you're on mute. Um, uh, am I still on mute now? No. Am I okay? Do you hear me now? I can hear you now. All right. Uh, thanks for doing this, Spence, uh, very much. I would lie to say that I've got a thousand things to challenge you with, but rather than, you know, picking a fight, which, which I always love to do, I'll, I'll, I'll push you in a few corners and, and see where you're coming from and what kind of answers you're going to give. Um, economy. You said we're doing relatively well. We're surprising forecasters and every quarter we're above expectations. And so, of course, you know, it's not all rosy in the world of rosy land, but uh, we're better than most people thought we would be uh, six months into COVID. You think it's being artificially supported by governments? And when that comes off, because at one point, I feel like it's going to have to. What's going to happen? Yes, it's being artificially supported, and thank God that it is. Uh, I was on the phone the other day with the Treasury Department and the two people that work directly with Mnuchin on the commercial real estate space. And what we talked about was the government ain't perfect, but did a lot of great things for us in this instance. And what does that mean? It means that collections would have fallen off a cliff in the absence of PPP. Collections would have fallen off a cliff in multifamily in the absence of unemployment insurance. And we would be uh, have a stock market which would be thousands of points below where it is right now. So yes, we are being artificially supported. And what the government is trying to do is build a bridge to tomorrow. And so to me, yes, we are being artificially supported. And that's a good thing. And I think it's going to continue. The one thing that's not gonna happen though is and what a lot of people had hoped for, what a lot of people had hoped for was the HOPE Act, uh, which was going to save CMBS, would come into play. It's not. HOPE Act is, uh, I don't want to be go so far and say it, but is hopeless. And, and, and the reason for what the HOPE Act was, was to save, was to save CMBS debt. People needed to um, get preferred equity that would go between the common and, and the uh, senior debt. Uh, that is now not happening. And um, and so what, what because of that, we think we're going to see a lot of distressed assets probably starting in January, February uh, in retail and hotels, absent, and I don't want to use the word hopeless or miracle, but absent a miracle. Go ahead, Mario. 
People will go back to the office, so you say, to the mall, to the hotels. The restaurant, the hotel, I've got no problem with. Uh, I, I love going there too, and you're on your way, and, and I think uh, I soon we're going to feel safer, no issues. Office. Mm -hmm. I agree with your positioning about, you know, culture of an enterprise and everything else, and, and I'll be the first one running back to the office just for the record. But what if people elect, and I've, I've got, a, I'm hearing that a lot, to go to stay two days at home, work three days, two days, three days. So let's say, you know, just for a sake of conversation, that we establish some kind of a routine where in one week you go two days and you stay home three, and following week you do the other way around. This could mean that for a business, you need, give or take a few, half the space. So let's say that it doesn't go that far, but you're still there to a one or two day a week. The reduction in demand could be immense. Don't you agree with that? Well, I believe that we have 200 years of human history of people going to offices, going to restaurants, going to hotels. And the reason why they went there for the last 200 years hasn't changed. It makes them better. It makes them more productive. It makes them happier. And so is it efficient to work from home for many people? It absolutely is. Do I work from home a lot? I absolutely do. But to say today that it's going to be 5% or 10% or 20% cannot be said. And we're doing everything we can to try to come up with it. Is it five? Is it 10? And how is it counterbalanced by densification? Uh, and that includes surveys, not only CBRE's proprietary surveys, but also through groups like KPMG and others. But also, uh, we are mathematically trying to break down uh, different industries, tech, oil and gas, healthcare, otherwise, and how their demand might shift. So I'm with you, Mario. I'm with you. It's a big risk factor, which is why we're seeing very few trades in office. We're seeing very few strategic leases happening. In fact, we're seeing more of the opposite. We're seeing an increase in sublet space. So yeah, it's a risk factor in the short term. But I'm going to be, bottom line, I'm betting on New York, San Francisco in the long term. And if you see opportunities coming out of those markets, particularly in office and in multifamily, not to use too, too uh, uh, optimistic of a term, back up the truck. Those markets are going to come back strong because talent wins. Talent is created and drawn to those markets and always will be. You said, quoting again as much as I can, Capital market, relatively sound, uh, but it's all seemed to be going towards multifamily and logistics. What are the risks that these have become too pricey by now? I had an interesting debate the other day, uh, and I hate to advertise my own podcast, but on my podcast, I had a terrific speaker named Dror Proleg, who was a futurist, and that was his argument. His argument was that the... Um, there's too much money chasing industrial. And his basic argument on industrial, on why he was, uh, he thinks it's too frothy, is because there's no alternative use for many of these industrial sites. I mean, particularly traditional industrial is in industrial parts of town. It's not near waterways. It's not near restaurants. And so if they are missing the boat on industrial um, construction or redevelopment, there's going to be a problem. And so uh, the, the argument is the lack of alternative use, and it's relatively cheap to build new supply. And I'll give one other argument against industrial. Again, this is not to say I'm against industrial. I am not. I'm very pro-industrial, but I'm giving you the counterpoint. Uh, the other argument is this. We have seen hockey stick growth in e-commerce in 2020. Mark my words. You're going to see hockey stick growth in e-commerce in 2021 negatively. Now, we're still going to be at a higher plane. We're not going to see hockey stick for another year. People are going to get back into more normal use. And the area where there is risk of froth is cold storage. It's an area that's like, oh, people are going to buy more groceries from home. I had on one of my podcasts the other day the CEO of AmeriCold, Fred Bowler. People still eat three meals a day. They don't eat four. And so because of that, you may not need as much additional supply and cold storage as you think as another example. On the multifamily side, I, I have to say that it is our number one investment idea. Uh, it was, we wrote a report back in February called the Age of Responsive Real Estate, uh, the 2030 report. It was, is, and remains our number one asset class. 
Uh, and I think some of the challenges that you're seeing right now in the cities is temporary. I think we need more vertical density, less horizontal density, though horizontal density in the form of single family sales or rentals are, are uh, an important form of housing. It's inefficient. Uh, and so I still believe that multifamily uh, is undersupplied over the long term, even though in the short term there are problems in some markets. Let's go to Mario. And actually, <clears throat> if I listen to you, and, and God knows I do, uh, people go back to the shopping mall. People are going to go back to the shopping mall. This, as you just said, will take away some of the e-commerce. You refer to hockey sticks. The Canadian and me cannot uh, dislike this, uh, this example. Good choice. Uh, but the fact that they will go back to the mall, uh, if I believe you, I'm tempted to believe you, then all the more reasons for logistics to uh, be worried when people are fully safe, vaccines out, Let's say we're mid-2021 by now. Uh, everybody goes back. What happens then? Even a correction, or am I going too far? I think you're going too far, Mario. And by the way, I'm now speaking on two phones. Can you, can you see my image on two things? On, on your screen? <laughs> I, I can see your eyes on something else. Uh, I, okay, I like it I'm, gonna keep your... I'm, I'm going to switch to the other for the moment because I may be losing power on my other device. Always have a backup device, and I have a backup device. <laughs> Good on so, you. So, uh, so long as my audio is clear, just let's make sure that that's uh, that's okay. So, so here's the deal, Mario, and I'll, and I'll keep that one off unless this one uh, powers down. Um, look, the long term is bright for all commercial real estate asset classes. The problem is, is that from a capital markets perspective, hope doesn't sell at the bank. Hope doesn't sell for MAI appraisers who need objective evidence to say that NOI is stable. The reason why some of the best real estate assets trade at a five cap, which for you math folks out there is the equivalent of a 20 times multiple while operating businesses trade lower is because of less risk. And that is the, um, the only way that people can come up with that number, whether it's a five time, a 20 times multiple or 10 times multiple is the stability of the cash flow string, which brings up another point. So yet another thing that we talk about in our 2030 report is the concept of new rent. And what is new rent? New rent. Is I'm losing you now, Spencer. For retailer, you have the ability. You got me, Mario? Yeah, I'm losing a word out of two now. Okay, can you hear I me? I don't now? know if it's just me. Can you hear me now, Mario? Yeah, I hear, I'm hearing you now. Okay. I hear you, Spencer. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, and, and by the way, I teach public speaking and I say, always have a backup device. <laughs> great, great, great idea. I've, I've got, I've got, I've got my phone. I've got my phone ready right here. Ah, see that? I was ready. So for, for those people <laughs> who are out there on these calls all the time, I have three devices here. I am ready to rock and roll. So um, the, con the concept of new rent is, is this. Uh, the concept of new rent is that you have the um, traditional way of paying rent, which is through a long-term lease, and then you have a percentage rent and other things. That new rent thing is coming into play in retail right now. And it's coming into play not only in terms of more percentage rent, but look what Brookfield and um, Simon did yesterday. They bought JC Petty. That means that they are in both the retail business and in the landlord business. Why? Because the line is now being blurred even further. So all your questions are appropriate, but I think you're gonna see evolution in the ways that I've just suggested in order to protect these asset classes over the long term. I'll, I'll, I wanna take you down the hotel route. I know, as you said, probably more listeners uh, are, are more into office, but we're, we're gonna to get to people's question very soon. Hotels. Uh, I totally adhere to the idea that there will be tourism with a vengeance. Because uh, now we all enjoyed our house this summer, all stayed by the pool. We didn't go too far, but as soon as we're going to feel safe, uh, we're going to hit the road and, and away we're going to go. And I believe that. So I'll, I believe there'll be some kind of vengeance tourism. 
on the personal front, I believe that. It's on the business front that I'm wondering. Yeah. How well, many it, conferences do you need to attend now that we've got this and this is now fully working? I mean, here we are chatting away. Uh, there's 300 people that are listening to us right now. Uh, how much do we need to go to the hotel for convention in the future? I'm not saying there'll be none, but there's got to be a drastic reduction. And if there is for hotels, that cannot be good. Uh, it's going to be a lag period. And that lag period is um, uh, probably going to be uh, two years for business travel to get back to normal and then three years for international business travel. So uh, where are we right now? September of 2020. So by the fall of the 2022 season, uh, we'll be close to back to normal. So about two years there. Uh, and But for international business travel, it's going to take a little, probably another year. So two to three years uh, to get back to normal. And by the way, in some of the most hard hit markets, it's going to take longer than that. I was on the phone last week with Jamie Lane, and Jamie is our head of hotel research. And Jamie um, is basically saying that it could take till 2024 for some markets as well. So it is going to be a while. Hmm. Last point I'll make with you, and you saw it before, and actually this is how we met, my friend. Uh, we met in Montreal at a Council of Real Estate conference. Uh, and I uh, brought in my back pocket uh, some uh, piece of work that was called Prosperous Cities because uh, I do believe that it's local, it matters, uh, and you already alluded to that. Um, and where I want to go with this is when you say talent will win, uh, and ultimately it's always talent that wins, there's going to be a huge effort that will have to be made by our cities with respect to attracting that talent. Uh, and to me, it's not that automatic that your traditional winners are necessarily those that work the hardest to attract the talent. How much do you see in terms of new markets in the United States that are really making an effort to attract this talent as our population is aging? And we need newcomers, and you need to attract talented people. Well, uh, this, is a, this is a comment uh, for those of you who are turning 50 tomorrow, which is me, and I'm sure some of you are in that vintage too. You remember early in your careers that a, my first job was in a law firm in New York City. I sat in a cube from 7 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night every day, uh, including a lot of weekends, for years Right. And then I went to an investment bank and did the whole thing again. Now people are going to markets like Denver. Oh, now you froze, Spencer. Michelle, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. I think we lost him. Um, oh, that's too bad. we just lost. We just um, lost Spencer. Maybe, maybe he'll try to come on, come back on. Yeah, what is uh, second or third option there? Yeah. So I'll take that time uh, while Spence is trying to uh, get back on, I'm sure, to wish a very happy birthday to Mary Fleischman tomorrow. Uh, but I think I just saw Spence. Spencer, you're back. Spencer? No. All right, well, I guess we'll turn it to questions from the audience. We can at least have a look at them while Spencer uh, tries to come back because the last thing I want to do is answer on behalf of Spencer. Well, let, me, let me ask you a question. I mean, you're, you're from the Central Bank. You're in discussion with your American colleagues as well. Um, what's, what's going to happen with the interest rates? Are they going to go negative? <laughs> Famous question, eh? Um, it, it is a great question. Um, we have no intention to go there just yet. Is it um, completely out of question? Wouldn't go there. Actually, the, the bank right now is really taking a look at the toolbox, analyzing everything. If you ask me personally, I'm not fully convinced that if you take interest rates from the lower bound, uh, which is somewhere between zero, zero and a quarter, 
and you make them negative that you're going to get all this agitation in the economy and everybody is going to go haywire. Uh, that, but that's my personal opinion. Uh, this is one of those times. Oh yeah, there you, there you are. But okay. Michelle, to, 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 to wrap up on on that, uh, we're we're looking at a toolbox right now, and uh, can't exclude anything. But I'm I'm one of those that's not particularly convinced on negative interest rate. Let's ask uh, Spencer how he feels. With really negative interest rates, Spence change the world that much, and would make everybody go haywire and crazy and the economy would just expand automatically? Yeah, Spence, the, the, the question is, really, are we going there? I mean, are we, are we going towards negative interest rates? And well, let, let me put it this way. We've been in a period of negative real interest rates for some time, and that has True. not stimulated the economy. Um, and the reason is this. We haven't had a liquidity problem in 10 plus years. What we have is a demand problem. So no, I think you, you could price interest rates to zero, below zero, which they already have. And I do not believe it will be stimulative. You, what you have is a, you have to find ways to stimulate that demand. That goes right back to the cruise ship comment I made before. And what the cruise ship comment I made before was, you price a cruise ship down to zero, you know what you're gonna get? Passengers. You know who one of those passengers is gonna be? Me. You know why? Because <laughs> cruises are awesome and cheap cruises are better. And so, but you need to strike that demand. So you take a company like Carnival that, are they gonna borrow more money at, a, at 0%? May, maybe they need it in the short term, but that's not gonna stimulate that demand. What is gonna stimulate demand are other things like that. England right now is talking about a proposal for the government to pay half of your restaurant check for the short term to be able to do that. So I would suggest to you that there are um, lots of uh, ways to stimulate that demand but it's not going to happen from cheap money. So I, I do not believe uh, negative interest rates uh, are a bad thing. I just don't think they work. Do you, do you think the federal government has done enough um, on the stimulus or should they do more or can they do more? Well, as, uh, Michelle, as I suggested during my opening comments, um, the federal government ain't perfect, but they did a lot of good. I mean, and they did it fast. They did it in bulk. And, and the reason why they did it was because there, was no, there are no villains here. Landlords didn't do anything wrong. Tenants didn't do anything wrong. We have a pandemic. They got shut down. And so there was no political, you're right, you're wrong, as related to the business community this time, as you might have had in the GFC when the people got over their skis from a financial standpoint, as you saw in the tech bubble in 2000. Um, all that said, and I said this to the Treasury three weeks ago, they need to do more. And they need to do more in the form of a couple of things. Number one, for our industry. As I suggested, the HOPE Act, and I, I, again, I don't want to be cute about this because there's a lot of CMBS borrowers on this call, and they're in a tough spot because they can't negotiate. The HOPE Act is in big trouble. I don't see that happening, uh, being able to uh, save a lot of these CMBS borrowers. But we could use something like that. Uh, we need more PPP funding. Uh, my wife owns a small business. She owns a physical therapy shop. Without that PPP loan, they would have been out of business. But they need more stimulus like that. And the other thing, and again, this is going to get a little political, but just cut, just take this at face value. You need funding for state and local governments. And these state and local governments, in the absence of that funding, are not to lay off thousands of people, of cops and teachers and other workers. Uh, and that's going to be devastating. And, and I know that's a Republican versus a Democrat issue. But boy, we need that desperately too. Spence, before Michelle uh, moves on to the next question, I totally agree with you. Um, I applaud all of this, and, and 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 you're right. We can't just let the economy drop. Is there though a ceiling? Is there because uh, you you know the old say like you you move into heavy deficit position. Uh, this could be really tough for the next generation because they'll probably be the ones having to uh, tighten their their belt a little more to help the government get back into some kind of sound fiscal shape. Is there a, a ceiling or you just do whatever is needed, up you go and you, you, you rescue the economy no matter the price? Well, Mario, I had a debate on stage uh, with a then congressman named Dave Bratt from um, uh, Virginia. 
And Dave, while I didn't agree with him on uh, a lot of things, um, he was a very good economist. And he said, look, um, we can both figure out how to grow the U.S. economy, and that's by uh, allowing more for immigration. We're talking about an immigration issue there, uh, immigration plus productivity. He says, we're thinking about the whole economy wrong. We should be thinking not in terms of GDP growth. We should be thinking in terms of standard of living. And the country that came to that conclusion was Japan. And so it brings you right back to your question about what is the optimal or the highest level of debt to GDP. U.S. just cracked 100%, which is way higher than uh, 100% of the economy in terms of our, our total debt. Japan's at 250%. So can we go higher? We can. And is Japan working? Well, uh, I will give you one example that it is working. And the example comes from a study which came out about a year ago. I think UBS came out with a study. And it had the least miserable countries on earth. It was, it was a misery index. Doesn't mean you're happiest, it means you're least miserable. You know where Japan came out on that list? Third, the third least miserable place on earth. Do you know where the United States came out on that? 38. I think we were right next to Bulgaria. So in terms of the obsession over growth, um, I'm still a huge growth advocate uh, and I'm prepared to back up the truck in terms of stimulus money to do so. Uh, because I think the alternative is stagnation. And again, this is not me to cast aspersions on Europe. I think Europe has stagnated, has stagnated post GFC in large part because they put their foot on the gas too soon, or put on the brakes too soon, rather. They stopped stimulating. And so keep stimulating until you can get that growth back into a faster trajectory. In the absence of that, you have the worst of both worlds. You have stagnation, uh, and your standard of living is not going to improve either. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, Spencer, the, um, first of all, I have, a, I have a question here, Mario. Um, intentionally cruel, actually, but since you brought it up, you brought a hockey subject up, which American team is going to win the Stanley Cup for the 27th year in a row? <laughs> <laughs> talking about the American. I've got a funny is hockey it? story. The, the day I but, back, see, but there's a serious think, side to the question, or another question, Mario, if you're if you can't answer that one. But, Spencer, um, and I had this question as well, you know, you're, you're pretty optimistic and, and I am an optimistic guy as well and quite involved in the, in the real estate market commercially. And so is Mario and, and all our attendees. Uh, but there are millions of people without jobs, lost their jobs, lost their, some are losing their house, uh, the inability to pay mortgage, um, no disposable income. And you're talking, you know, one, two, three years. Um, I, I have a problem with that. I mean, I think obviously, as we know, real estate is always lags the economy in terms of uh, recovery. But this is pretty serious. This is pretty deep in terms of recession. Uh, we're already on a downturn before the COVID got into play. Obviously, the COVID accelerated and amplified the, the recession and the consequences are quite, quite serious, not only in America, but across the globe. Um, what do you say about that? Well, look, the, the, yeah, I'm here. Um, the tragedy that we have here is that the, have, the split between the haves and the have nots has gotten wider. Uh, it's gotten wider over the last 10 years and this has accelerated that widening as uh, the people that can work from home are people that are typically uh, higher paid white collar workers, people who have to physically go to the office are the blue collar workers uh, or restaurant workers or people that have to physically be in the service industries uh, that are uh, there. And those got hit harder than everybody else. And so you can't put the, uh, you can't put the genie back in the bottle with respect to, higher educated folks are going to do better. Can't do that. In fact, you can't bring low end manufacturing back to the United States. So the only, so, there are two solutions here. Solution number one is continuing to educate the economy, the, the population so that these job losses are mitigated, that they're more durable over the long term. But there's another thing, and this comes you know, out of left field. You need to have the haves and the have nots living in proximity to one another, because otherwise you're going to see 
uh, this hyper political environment that we have today get worse. And so um, there's a, uh, a lot of economists, a lot of folks believe that the number one flaw in the world today is an empathy gap. I agree with that. And the empathy gap, it's hard to quantify, but what it means is that two people who are different than one another can't be taught to like one another unless they're together. That's what empathy is. And so I think you need to improve education, but you have to have the haves and the have-nots and people that are different living in the same places. Uh, otherwise, uh, things are just going to get worse. Um, another one, another question. People do enjoy being the office, as you said. But will suburban workers prefer suburban office location now that they have experience no commuting to downtowns? Some do. A couple days a week. I live in the suburbs. Um, and I, I was working from home on Fridays, most Fridays anyways, because I've got three kids, a dog, and a minivan. Um, but I, my, my office is opening up next week. And I guess who's going to the office? This guy. And so, um, yeah, it's going to diminish demand. And that brings up what's known as the hub and spoke system. And the hub and spoke system is one where uh, there's going to be a, a diversity of different types of offices. We've already seen a material increase in so-called TIMS, tenants and market looking to take sublet or shorter term space in some of these suburban areas. And yes, I, this didn't come up on today's call. I'm surprised it didn't, but flex space. Flex space is getting uh, huge demand uh, in some of these suburban areas today, which is part of the reason why we're very bullish on the future of flex, notwithstanding some of the short term issues they're facing in uh, high density markets. Correct. What do you say about the future of co-working and, and space sharing? I mean, we saw the IWG group uh, going under uh, bankruptcy protection. We know all about co uh, WeWorks. Uh, yeah, you I'm, very I'm very bullish on co-working. I'm very focused on flex space, but I think that there's two segments of that space. One of the segments is where you have multiple people crammed on top of each other in bench style seating. And the other is demised space. And I think that the my space portion of it has a very bright future. I think the other portion of it has a bright future as well, but they need to figure out the model in terms of safety in the short term. Over the long term, I don't think high density uh, use is a problem. Over the short term, obviously, they need to get past it. You think industrial real estate right now, and uh, especially the logistic and distribution is overpriced? There's not that many transactions, obviously, but there are transactions going on. Well, and the man my, good friend and, and my good friend and colleague on, on this call, uh, Jack Fraker on this call, he would be throwing laser beams at me if I said yes to that question, right? But I, I, would, hearken, <laughs> I would hearken back to what I said before, which is there is a counter argument to be made about industrial, about alternative use uh, isn't there. There is an argument to be made that cold storage, people eat three meals a day, not four. Uh, and there's also this weight of money thing. There's just so much money that's in real estate that I had to transfer out of or tried to transfer out of retail, hotels, and increasingly office. And this is the last bastion. So there may be too much money chasing it, but it's going to be chasing it for a long time. And so far, the fundamentals support it. I have a statement here, uh, part of our questions uh, that deals with uh, the hospitality and hotels. But uh, the comment is the business travel uh, is really and will affect uh, hotels due to the tech switch and the efficiency and virtual communication. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, Mario and yourself talked about conferences, but there's a lot of business travels, obviously, without going to conferences uh, between you know business places. And uh, it, this virtual switch is definitely going to be affecting this. Uh, have a comment on that? Uh, maybe that will probably push your three-year uh, horizon maybe further for the hotels. Well, let me put it this way. If you think I'm super dynamic speaking on this call, having to switch from my computer to my handheld phone to my iPad, I will tell you that may have been like a Houdini move, but doggone it, I don't want to do it again. I'm much more dynamic <laughs> on stage. And I was going to ask you, have you done that before? <laughs> This is the first time I had to go to my, 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 my double backup device. Right. <laughs> um, basically, uh, um, a question on distress and block sales. Uh, despite the moratorium and the, the eviction and foreclosures, uh, are we going to start seeing those transactions in terms of uh, block sales and on distressed properties? Do you see this coming uh, soon? Or? Yeah, so... Um, Many moons ago, during the global financial crisis, I got a funny story. Yeah. 
So my funny story is uh, when TARP came out at that time, Trouble Asset Relief Program, I sent my then boss at the time a memo. I say, this is what TARP means for us. And they sent me back a email to say, congratulations, you now run the restructuring group. My answer was, we don't have a restructuring group. Their answer was, we do now. Well, <laughs> we've been uh, reluctant to do a restructuring group this time, in part because the government has raised the bottom so much. But I will tell you that uh, if this HOPE Act doesn't come through or something like it, you're going to see a lot of distress at the market. January, February. Uh, in the retail and uh, hotel segments. Uh, we certainly hope it doesn't come to pass, uh, but that's where you're gonna see it because those borrowers who have a traditional bank, an FDIC insured bank or an ECB bank, those guys uh, have gotten, well, most of them have gotten covenant relief. Um, Fannie and Freddie's obviously helped multifamily. So short answer is you are gonna begin to see that then, but you might not necessarily see bulk sales like you saw in the RTC days in the early 1990s. You'll see them bled out in, in, in one and twos. But the best assets, they're going to move heaven and earth and not bring those to market. We're passing our hour now, but uh, I'd like to have another question here, Spence and Mario, uh, pitch in if you, if you can. Uh, it's on your, the view on your future of cities and why do some cities attract talent more effectively than others? Uh, well, then they win because talent is everything. And so that's why you go back to the example of my sitting in a cube in New York City for you know, 17 hours a day versus my cousin who live in Denver and they go skiing on the weekends um, and they uh, live in a beautiful environment there and they have great jobs. So places that can give you that live, work, play environment are going to be superior to those that can't. But let's face it, New York and San Francisco have fantastic live, work, play environments. They're just expensive as hell. So um, they're still going to attract talent at those higher paying jobs, which are still going to be in those markets. So bottom line is this, is that the cities are always, people are, I'll cut to the chase here. There was a terrific op-ed written in the New York Times last week by Jerry Seinfeld. Everybody needs to read that. New York has been getting thrown under the bus since the beginning of New York. You got Gerald Ford toward New York to drop dead. People are going back there because that is where the highest paying jobs are. That's where the action's at. The liberal compliant environment is great. And people will double or triple up in apartments to live there. So I don't buy the whole New York, San Francisco is dead thing at all. And matter of fact, I said back up the truck there. I, I mean it. It's a great, those are great markets over the long term. This is also why you're saying productivity is more important than efficiency. Oh, not it, black and white. The only reason why... You, I have some people that are doubters out there is because you can't measure productivity. Efficiency can be measured to the penny. Productivity, you don't know. And so because of that, people say, well, I'll just focus on this side of it. Well, the great companies really focus on productivity. <clears throat> okay, well, I guess our time is over. Um, I would continue this for another hour, Mario. What do you think? I was uh, I, I was wanting to put uh, Spence in a corner before we go, but I, I don't know. I'm just afraid he's going to be upset at me. You don't have to answer, my we're, friend. We're but ahead, uh, <laughs> you 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 escaped it, and but I, I must ask, who's going to win in November? Well, is it, we're out of time here, folks. Nice talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, well, uh, you don't have to answer. You don't have no, to answer. I'll, but, I'll answer the question. I mean, right now, obviously, it looks like Biden but I think it's going to be a lot closer than people think because I think there's a lot of, I think what was proven the last time is people aren't always telling the pollsters the truth. And then there will be a mess, but we won't get into that uh, in terms of the loser recognizing, but anyway, uh, that's beyond uh, this conversation. Thank you so much, Spence. You're a sport uh, and happy birthday, oh, my friend. I'm to switch devices, but we made it work. We made it work. Happy birthday. Enjoy your weekend. Michelle. Thank you, thank you all. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Always a pleasure. And thank you, Mario. So thank you Thanks. very much, Spence and Mario. Uh, I trust our viewers will agree that this has been one of the most spirited and entertaining hours of real estate dialogue this year, even though we passed the hour. And we're privileged to have you shared it with us. Uh, I encourage everyone to visit cre.org slash webinars for information on upcoming presentations, including Robert White, CRE founder, 
uh, and CEO of Real Capital Analytics, as well as Jim Costello, uh, CRE as well, the firm's senior vice president. RCA has widely been credited with fostering market transparency and pioneering research to better quantify property prices, liquidity, and capital flows. And also Tom Shirtliff, CRE co-founder and principal of Intelligent Building LLC, discussing with other industry leaders the prevailing issues of the future of office building and workplaces, uh, both in developing new concepts and retrofitting existing assets. Watch for more details on this and other thought-provoking sessions in development. On-demand recordings will be available for most sessions, including today's. Until then, on behalf of the Counselors of Real Estate, thank you for attending What's Next for Real Estate and Life Experience. Thank you all.